Hello everyone, I am Rajesh Isan Gupta and we are in the middle of this course Indian Art Materials, Techniques and Artistic Practices. Now we are here at week 10 and then we will be talking about daily practice and nationalism. So what do I mean by these two words? Let me get into nationalism first. So as we have seen that in the last two weeks we have spoken about some of the practices which were associated with the colonialism in the Indian subcontinent. Essentially how printing, painting, those processes, those, those techniques, these new techniques have emerged in the Indian subcontinent and how they have also served the administration of the British government and then how also that I mean how the how the indigenous people the the people from India the artists the artisans they have taken up these practices and they have improvised to make them suited for the people in India. Now with that we see that in the late 19th century I mean of course it was there in the 19th century and perhaps like the 1857 mutiny and uh, many other revolts in the 19th century could be uh, considered as some of the major uh, anti-colonial movements. Now, in the late 19th century, we find that I mean more sort of organized movement to uh, overthrow the colonial government was was there in place in the various parts of Indian subcontinent. And with that we see that the, the rise in terms of like the, the rise of the idea of India as a nation and this nationalistic politics was, was um, you know gaining momentum. So in that respect when we talk about nationalism, when we will be addressing nationalism in this, uh, in this week, so we will be looking into the practices in the late 19th century, in the early 20th century and mid 20th century. Now few of the things we will be looking at this week, it might not seem directly connected to the way we understand art. And that also happens because some of the things that those were uh, you know uh, prompted by the colonial art education that what is art, what is not art, when, uh, how art is different from the daily practices, how art is different from craft, all these differences, these binaries were also something that, that became more and more prominent uh, by the, uh, in the colonial art institutions and in the colonial education policy. So those things for that reason as I have already mentioned that certain things we will be looking at today uh, might not seem conventionally situated in the sphere of fine arts. However, with the uh, as as we go with the lecture i'm sure we will all find out that i mean how they all are uh, integral part of understanding the visual culture in india and also um, how how our lives uh, um, you know uh, are are situated around them so with that i mean i'd be uh, you know as as we know that i mean here we have uh, this this map of india it was a, it is a map from 1947 this, this uh, crucial moment when India gained its freedom from the British rule and uh, it shows various parts of the Indian subcontinent. So as you can see that I mean this, this entire area which is, which is uh, you know which was then considered as India and then in this map there are like the sections which are sort of removed. So you can imagine like this section will be here and then like I mean this part of the Indian subcontinent like I mean the northeastern part that will also be added. So this was the entire breadth and um, you know of the Indian subcontinent. So one can imagine that I mean today the way we understand India is not something that used to be in the late 19th century in the early 20th century. So the, the places what we understand today as Pakistan and Bangladesh both those places were, were also part of um, the united India or, or the uh, Indian uh, you know the Indian subcontinent the way India was considered in the late 19th and early 20th century. 
Now, with that, we see that I mean, with the growing, uh, you know, the nationalist and anti-colonial, uh, you know, activities, there was an attempt in 1905 to divide the Bengal presidency into into two parts. So this is the area what I'm talking about, and um, so that is where we find that I mean, today's Bangladesh and uh, India's West Bengal, both both these areas, they were all constituted. They all constitute. The, the area of um, you know the Bengal presidency and since the the colonial um, uh, the seat of power the, the the capital city of the colonial India was Ke Calcutta here so that's the reason Bengal presidency certainly had uh, its its prime importance in the nationalistic politics now for that reason what we see that I mean during the 1905 there was a large scale protest against it. And then uh, there have been many different kind of activities, including Rabindranath Tagore's attempt of uh, going out in the street and and uh, tying Rakhi in the hands of all the people to 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 uh, to promote this idea of undivided uh, Bengal. And then through that thing, through those uh, you know practices, we find that I mean uh, that the British had finally uh, made a decision to move the capital from Calcutta to Delhi and uh, this this all these political decisions this political shifts all those things were taking place during this time and the, then from 1905 until 1947 we see that there were a number of different kind of um, activities that that marked the first half of 20th century in the Indian subcontinent and they, they also not only just there the political events but they also had a huge impact on the way we understand materials today. Now what are those uh, you know what, what are those important political moments or the movements which also uh, which are also connected to our study. So, Two uh, movements in particular I'd, I'd mention here. So the, uh, the these two movements and which will be uh, which were uh, spearheaded by Mahatma Gandhi and so uh, in the early 1920s that we find that I mean Mahatma Gandhi who was already a prominent um, you know a, a prominent uh, political persona in India and then he would uh, take up some of the measures for his uh, very well known violent movement so what what is non violent movement so there were two kinds of uh, movements which were uh, or like i mean two kinds of strategies which were uh, there during this time so some of the strategies involved violent uh, clashes between the British troops and the Indian nationals. I mean, of course, like I mean, the freedom fighters. And then some of the other strategies uh, would uh, include, like I mean, the one which was uh, prompted by Mahatma Gandhi was this non-violent movement in which he uh, pr uh, he he urged everyone not to take up arms or not to uh, attack the British troop but to continue doing their work um, without any kind of violent move. So, and then the thing is that I mean this, this was a revolutionary move and with that what we find that I mean there were two movements which, which were the, perhaps the most important ones. And uh, for that reason I mean I will not start with the movement that happened in the early 1920s, but I will start the discussion from 1930. And so the first, I mean, the the one that that came up in 1930 was Gandhi's Salt March or the Salt Satyagraha. And the, then Salt Satyagraha was the one in 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 which, like, I mean, Mahatma Gandhi uh, announced that since making salt, that is the one of the basic uh, need for every Indian or perhaps like I mean everywhere in the world, making salt by the Indians was banned. And that is something that he considered as denial of one of the basic rights by the Indian nationals and, and under the British rule. So he said that, I mean, we will be taking up this non-violent gesture of walking from Ahmedabad, the city of Ahmedabad in Gujarat to the coast in, in this place called Dandi. And then from uh, there, what he proposed to like, I mean, make salt from the seawater. 
and it was a very in in one hand one can see that i mean it was a very non violent gesture at the same time something that is related to our daily lives that i mean making salt that goes back to that that uh, you know enriches our daily life that is something that should not be considered as a violent mode of protest performance i'd say this performance was so um, 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 effective that the British government eventually came and stopped the uh, people who were uh, part of the salt march and then Gandhi was put in uh, jail for around a year and during this time more and more people would come forward to make their own salt from the sea water and uh, millions of uh, I mean uh, thousands of people were put um, under the bars. So, this is how uh, he he sort of like i mean uh, introduced some of this some of these ideas and uh, when when the british uh, uh, you know reacted violently upon this non violent marchers who were part of gandhi's uh, gandhi's gandhi's group so uh, if when we see this this kind of like i mean violent uh, mode of action had taken place on them that was also something which was looked down upon by the people in not only in the indian subcontinent but all over the world so those those certainly uh, gained momentum they, they they certainly helped the indian nationals to to uh, you know have a have a strong cause to overthrow the british government so this these are some of the ways in which we find that why this this activities gandhi's activities which were focused around daily life was such a potent act such an important uh, you know gesture to 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 uh, overthrow this colonial government and that is how we find that the daily life the practices the the daily practices of like making salt using it and then nationalism that this this uh, mammoth task of overthrowing the british government uh, which was ruling uh, india for more than 150 years then so uh, so these two things became integrally connected and uh, in and this particular gesture of like i mean connecting daily life to nationalism something that is not really i mean you know uh, compelling people to go out of their way to support the cause of uh, you know overthrowing the british government these things we would find that i mean it had a huge impact on the kind of materials that we use even today now after i mean uh, before this this salt uh, satyagraha or the salt march we see that in the early 1920s mahatma gandhi also started something even more revolutionary and that is to uh, that is to uh, make hand spun and hand woven cotton cloth now when we see that i mean and that uh, you know this this particular gesture this is also something that goes back to the daily practice of weaving and spinning that that had been prominent in the indian subcontinent for millennia now again why this act is such an important one and why this uh, this particular uh, you know gesture of of making uh, hand spun cotton and then weaving it into just regular cloth that that became such a uh, um, you know important tool or an important weapon to fight the the british government so this this particular cotton that we, we have already addressed this hand spun and hand woven cotton is something that is known as khadi and khadi this word comes from the idea of khadar and so what what happened with that so here on screen we have images and this is uh, an iconic image of mahatma gandhi and what we find here this one was a uh, you know like i mean this one uh, was this photograph was taken by margaret bourke white and what we have here is that there is this spinning wheel in the foreground and in the background we see that i mean um, mahatma gandhi is seated there in his um, you know only draped in 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 a lower garment and that is also just a regular white cotton dhoti and then uh, he he is engaged in reading something and this is an image which was taken in 1946 it was right before the independence so 
what is uh, and uh, you know in in the right side of the screen uh, we have image of this uh, uh, cotton so this is cotton which is which is uh, produced in the uh, state of telangana today and and just to give a sense of how cotton looks like and the how cotton is harvested and then that is spun into thread and then that is used for weaving and ultimately we have clothes like this to wear so there is a long process involved and gandhi uh, was was an advocate for for uh, you know making this hand spun hand woven uh, fabric so to understand the politics of what was happening around textile we need to go a little back in time now from the beginning of the colonial rule in the in the um, you know in the uh, 18th century we find that i mean textiles have played a major role because textile historically the indian textiles both dyed and undyed and uh, you know patterned and everything so all different kind of textiles had a huge overseas market and that had sustained this market system had sustained for uh, more than 2000 years now during the colonial rule we find i mean even when the uh, the british uh, or or the other european uh, uh, you know the administrators and the traders they have arrived in the indian subcontinent one of their major attraction was textile apart from the spices so we see from the beginning in the 18th century there was much stress in in terms of like i mean getting the indian textiles to uh, western europe and that is how to uh, the, it it was a, it was a huge Uh, there there was a huge market for this indian textile and that is how they made huge profit through this now slowly we find that there was also an attempt of uh, uh destroying the this this uh, self sustained uh, um, you know industry of making textiles in the indian subcontinent and by doing that what the british people did the administrators so they they uh, focused on getting the raw material mostly so slowly we find that i mean in the in the 18th century in the early 19th century whereas there was more stress in getting the textiles and then transporting them to uh, europe then slowly we find that there was a drive towards um, you know destroying the indigenous industries and then getting the raw material as cotton and silk and so on and sending them to to europe for for uh, making them into a mill made uh, cotton fabric and that is how the mill made cotton fabric would be sent back to india on a much higher price and sold to the people in india so if there is no self sustained uh, textile industry in india then the indian people would be compelled to buy the cotton which was um, you know like i mean brought by the british and that is how all the revenue will go back to the um, uh, to to britain so this is how we see that this systematic way the the textile industry was was uh, highly disrupted if, uh, during the uh, colonial period and for this reason we also find that uh, you know in in some of the uh, exhibitions so for example if we talk about the 1851 the great exhibition in the crystal palace in london if we see that there was a uh, uh, in this one there there were uh, uh, you know objects from the indian subcontinent from various other uh, colonies of the uh, which which were uh, under the british rule so in among different kind of objects we find that i mean textiles definitely had prominence different kinds of specialized textiles so here on screen we have this one particular uh, this this uh, unique uh, you know design for making a portable museum of textile and this was made by john forbes watson and it was around 1876 and in this one we find that there is this um, you know like i mean there there is this portable uh, stand up upon which there are all those there, there are those uh, you know like i mean those uh, frames 
in which there are those textile there are many textile pieces or swatches which are arranged and perhaps there are also description of those textile swatches so that one can just like flip them around and see them and uh, know about the different kind of textile practices. So, and Forbes Watson was someone who had also extensively documented the different kind of textile practices in the Indian subcontinent. Now, with that we also find that in some of those exhibitions uh, in the um, you know in the later half of uh, 19th century that even the uh, weavers the entire loom setup was uh, transported from India to Britain during exhibitions. So, this is this one uh, image that we see here in the right side of the screen and, and here we see that the gold brocade weavers and they are from the colonial and the India exhibition in 1886 that took place in London. So, this entire setup of the loom with the weavers all of them were transported to London and they were displayed in the museum setup. So, Alongside the loom which produces the textile, these weavers were also made part of this anthropological display where people can see them working. So, these are the, these are those, uh, uh, these are the context in which we find that I mean textile had this huge importance uh, for, for the colonial administration. Now, if we get into the details about like what kind of destruction took place and one of the things that, that got lost during the colonial period among many different practices was muslin. Muslin is this very specialized uh, um, you know technique, uh, very specialized uh, um, cotton fabric which is considered as woven air. So, that means it is diaphanous in its, uh, in its quality, it is transparent, it is so transparent that one can see through it. So, like I mean uh, even after wearing like several layers of muslin, one can still see uh, you know what is beneath the, the, the layers of it. So, that kind of thin highly uh, you know like I mean highly skilled um, um, uh, weaving uh, is involved in making this, this uh, muslin fabric. So, some of the representation of the muslin we find and uh, muslin was not produced in various part of the Indian subcontinent, but only in the um, you know in the area around Dhaka or part of Bengal. So, uh, the, the area those that, that particular area with its riverine land, we find that that was this, the, this damp and humid weather was perfect for um, you know cultivating this, this particular kind of cotton which which had this this fiber for making this this super fine thin yarn so uh, and that kind of yarn was uh, woven into the muslin fabric and then we find those kind of fabrics were uh, represented in the miniature paintings during the mughal time period and even before that so some of the and of course that I mean muslin has a longer history that as we know that I mean it had been uh, exported to various parts of Europe and, and uh, other parts of the globe uh, you know for, for, for the last 2000 years or so. So, this, this particular um, skill or this, this particular practice of making uh, or producing the muslin cloth, this highly specialized muslin cloth was there, it sustained in Bengal for nearly 2000 years. And so, this is an image that, that we have and this is this comes from uh, 17th century in the left side of the screen in which we find that Dara Shiko and Suleiman Shiko, this this two uh, Mughal princes and then what we see them that I mean they, uh, uh, they are draped in muslin. So, we see the muslin jama that they, they wear. So, as I have already mentioned that, that the translucent quality of muslin, so one can see the trouser through this jama, one can see their skin through this jama. So, this is this is something this is a very uh, characteristic feature of the muslin and the, uh, the miniature painters they made sure to emphasize this particular character because muslin was not just highly skilled uh, fabric, but it was also a highly prized possession. It is not really like everyone can afford to have this muslin fabric. So, that is the reason we also find how the miniature painters in the Mughal court have put the effort 
to show this diaphanous quality this translucent quality of this fabric to uh, and uh, that that also stands as as a as a uh, marker for us to see how uh, this this is um, you know this was used uh, for you know like i mean during the early modern period and so on so the other quality of muslin that we also know as that i mean how for for this um, you know for the super fine thread which is used or the yarn that is used it can be passed through a ring which is which is worn in a finger so like this one and this is a contemporary construction of a muslin in bangladesh but i mean it uh, so this kind of fine quality of fabric was produced then i mean uh, what happened during the colonial time period was that i mean in the 18th century in early 19th century muslin was uh, also it became a prized possession for the elites in britain but then slowly there was a drive towards we can see that how the british was was uh, involved in in uh, getting more and more fabric out of the uh, out of the weavers in bengal but the weavers were underpaid and they had horrible uh, livelihood conditions so it was certainly not possible for the weavers to continue working in this method at the same time we also see like the textile mills in manchester they started producing um, um, this this mill made uh, fine cotton and then which was not comparable to muslin but it sort of like i mean uh, replaced the market and that is how slowly we find that the muslin uh, was um, um, you know discarded and and with with this uh, you know very uh, um, you know like i mean uh, with with the dire uh, livelihood conditions of the weavers it was not viable for them to continue making this muslin cloth anymore and with the manchester cloth um uh, the the mill made cloth from manchester in the market muslin also lost its uh, market in 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 the indian subcontinent and so on so that is how we find that this particular this highly specialized fabric had died out in the indian subcontinent now in the next phase we will be seeing that i mean how gandhi's um, act of of uh, revitalizing the uh, you know like the the textiles in in the indian subcontinent has um, sort of like i mean uh, breathed new life into into this um, you know like i mean in, into this this uh, fabric now we do not see that gandhi revitalized the muslin itself but what he uh, considered important in this case was to think about uh, this this mode of production how muslin if we consider that i mean how muslin was produced that it is hand spun hand woven and it is uh, likewise like all the other different kind of um, you know different kind of textiles that we find in the indian subcontinent that all of them were hand spun hand woven before the advent of this mill made cotton from mill made fabric from from uh, from manchester and parts of western europe so gandhi reclaimed this part of the history and then uh, you know uh, sort of like i mean folded into the nationalist movement we'll get into more of the details in the next lecture thank you mm -hmm.